And it appeared to me that uh, one could go back to its past and understand how they, un how they you know, the ideological foundations, doctrinal foundations of this needed to be recovered. Um, and what I'm going to present to you is an overview argument. Uh, I won't be able to get into the specifics, but would be very, very happy to answer questions about any of those specifics. So what I would present today is an overview of four or five phases of the evolution of idea of equality in India through the 20th century and how we came to where we are today. And finally say a word or two about how it can possibly be recast today, which is what possibly connects it to my current birth. I'll begin tracing that journey from the 19th century. Because in many ways, it is the later half of the 19th century that sets terms for how we were to understand the idea of equality. Just a word about pre-colonial past. You know, we all have a broad understanding which is that here was a caste-ridden hierarchical society that never contemplated equality. That's the very rough picture with which egalitarians look at past, at pre-modern past. I don't know how many of you share that thought, but the beginning of the journey should be rethinking that assumption itself. Because what we have in pre-modern, pre-colonial past of India are multiple ways of reflecting on equality, except that equality is understood in a very different context. There are two contexts there. One is equality before God, you know, which is what uh, is talked about, basic unity of mankind. You look at the Bhakti tradition, Sufi tradition, it's all about basic unity of mankind reversal of material hierarchies in, mat you know, in matters spiritual. And equality is reflected, A, equality before God, and B, equality within the self, which is equanimity. These two are dominant ways of thinking about equality. This, of course, is very unfamiliar to modern egalitarians, because modern egalitarians want to understand equality in material terms. They want to, to understand it in terms of distributive equality of goods and commodities. That is not available in that tradition. And therefore, it was very easy for modern egalitarians to say, this was a caste hierarchical society, had no notions of equality. So just a footnote there, and we move on. We stop, the first stop is latter half of the 19th century. <clears throat> In 1870s, you have three texts that come up in three different parts of India. One is by a less known Marathi thinker called Vishnu Bhava Brahmachari, who wrote, writes this uh, very unusual tract called Sukhdayak Raj Prakarani Nibandha, 1876. It's a little Platonian vision. And it basically, he advocates communism. He's not familiar with, he has no Western education. He's not familiar with any of the Western ideas of communism or something of that kind. But he has, he proposes an ideal state, somewhat similar to Plato's ideal state, where property is to be vested in state, caste is to be abolished, children are to be handed over to king, and state is to arrange for education and marriage. This is 1876 someone who has no formal English, you know, formal Western education or connect. Equality is treated in material terms. Yet for him, equality is not an organizing principle of society. 1873, another text, somewhat better known, Gulamgiri by Jyoti Bapule. Jyoti Bapule, of course, has English education. He has influence of European religion, radicals, and American revolution on him. There's a conscious deployment of Western categories 
freedom, equality, rights. But where he twists it is to bring the focus on caste. And there's comprehensive critique of caste system and Brahminic dominance. And very unusual for his times, he extends this critique to man-woman relationship. One of the first Indian thinkers to think about what we today would call feminism. He deploys popular culture and mythology. Fule is no nationalist. He actually supports British regime. That's 1873 Gulamgiri. In 1879, in Bengal comes a very famous essay by a very well-known thinker, Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay. The essay is called Samya, literally equality. And most thinkers, who, most academics who write about the idea, history of the idea of equality usually begin their journey with this essay. This is the first essay written in India which is aware of Western egalitarian tradition and carefully cast itself in that tradition. He's familiar with European socialism, communism. He's disinterested in their metaphysics, in their philosophy of history and things of that sort. His attention is to the concept of equality, specifically the critique of social differences beyond natural differences. He too does a critique of man-woman relationship, inequality in man-woman relationship and critique of exploitation of peasantry. The state of peasantry in Bengal is something that interests him. He writes about it. Bonkim is also, as we know, a staunch nationalist. Having written this very first pioneering essay on the idea of equality in 1879, Bonkim strangely withdraws that essay. In 1892, he actually formally withdraws that essay and says what I said was silly. Don't take me seriously. You know. Why? Because the idea of equality is in tension with the idea of nationalism. As a nationalist, he does not want to be seen to be exposing fissures in his society. Talk about peasantry and jamidar and all kinds of inequality. What we get in these three texts, just briefly introduced, is a shift in the idea of equality. The received idea of equality, remember that notion of equality before God and inner equality, equanimity. From that we now have a shift from necessary corollary of equality of human beings. Equality here becomes the organizing principle of good society. That's the one big difference. Equality now is at the center of thinking about future society, which it was not before. Two, it is shifted to a different domain from moral and metaphysical and spiritual. It is shifted to the more familiar, familiar to us today, familiar domain of distribution of material goods, distribution of justice, distributional justice is the end. And third, the bearer of responsibility, who is to give equality? Earlier, it was me unto myself. Now we have a familiar actor that steps in, state. State is to provide equality. So we have now the beginning of somewhat familiar notions of equality, familiar to us today, which is laid in the late 19th century. Let me jump to the early 20th century. It's a fascinating period not quite researched, and those of you who may have some interest in uh, history of ideas, uh, I would urge you to look at that. 19th century has been explored, looked at. Early 20th century is fascinating because Indians by now know that there is socialism, there is communism, they have an idea, except that the information is fairly limited. This is a period of what I call free translations. We have a broad idea of what socialism might mean and then we do a lot of value addition of our own and present it to the people to say this is socialism, this is Marxism, this is communism. One exemplary text of that is Lala Hardayal's 
the famous Lala Hardayal. He had a book called Karl Marx, A Modern Rishi. The title gives you something. 1912, Karl Marx is a Rishi. Lala Hardayal is, uh, provides a, uh, I mean, as we know, Lala Hardayal has English education, has been educated abroad, founder of the Gadar Party in the US, and later on who also writes Hints for Self-Culture, which becomes very, very famous book at some point. It, he offers a very sympathetic exposition of Marx's ideas and life. But interestingly, in this, the focus is more on Marx's life than on Marx's ideas. It's Marx the Rishi, who undergoes, undergoes difficulties, undergoes sacrifice. That is the one Lala Hardayal High writes. There's fairly accurate depiction of Marx's ideas. But what is his judgment about Marx's ideas? He finds them one-sided and defective. Focus on moral message of communism which is that land should belong to the community. His emphasis is on character. And he nicely assimilates Marx into nationalism. That is why official histories of Marxism in India are very uneasy about this book. Either they don't mention this book, or if they mention, they sort of uh, say, but he never understood Karl Marx, etc. Because in a sense, what he's doing is that he is incorporating Karl Marx in a native register, native register of sensibilities of uh, what is a, in the nationalist movement and a register of Indian sensibilities of what is it worth celebrating about Karl Marx. It's a very different reading of Karl Marx. Through the 1910s, you have lots and lots of essays. Indian Hindi magazines are full of essays about Karl Marx, about, uh, about uh, socialism. No, I shouldn't say they are full of it. They are full of it after 1917. 1917 Bolshevik Revolution onwards, the first five years are absolutely full of all kinds of reports on socialism, on the experiment of Russia. Something very big is taking place in Russia. And Indians must bring the news to their compatriots. Except that the news is very inadequate. They don't really know facts. Now, this could be seen as a problem. But I look at it as actually an occasion for creativity. This was the one short period when Indian reading of Marxism and socialism was actually at its creative best. You know, lack of information gives you a lot of room to be creative. So Indians were mixing their interpretation. So it was value addition was taking place at every stage in terms of facts, in terms of imagination, in terms of dreams. Everything was being mixed. Uh, I, that phase is really worth looking at. Because in a sense, Indians were writing their dreams into what they thought was Russia. You know? uh, this is a period when Indian socialism is experimental. It is, as I said, free translations. I read your text. I translate it freely to say what I think it means. You know, uh, This period is, to my mind, interesting because this open-ended engagement with the idea of equality. Marxist ideas are selectively received and rearranged. At some stage, I called it a pigeon socialism. Pigeon as in pigeon languages, pigeon and Creole languages. You know, what they do is that they pick from a mother language. They pick a few phrases. Their vocabulary is much shorter. So you pick about 200 words. And with the help of those 200 words, you describe the entire universe. So, uh, so it was a pigeon language where received vocabulary of Marxism and socialism was truncated, cut into pieces, rearranged. Uh, that's what we were witnessing at that time. Of course, official Marxism, official left, does not think very much about that phase, because it's embarrassing. Uh, I really think that is one of the most creative phases of Indian socialism, Indian left. Interestingly, there was no specification about how India was to be read. 
how should an egalitarian look at India was still an open question, left to your imagination, left to your reading. Then comes guillotine, 1921, a Bengali thinker produces a book which is end of imagination, end of creativity, end of free-floating ideas. The thinker is M. N. Roy. The book is India in Transition. Unlike all these other people, M. N. Roy actually has, actually reads Marx. He knows European languages. He has some access to German language. He has actually traveled. He has actually seen it, although the book comes just before his no, 21 is actually when he's just had a, he's been invited to Russia by Lenin and he has a brief encounter with Lenin. M. N. Roy writes a book explaining what is India and what is a correct egalitarian reading of India. I really think once you read that book, you can almost read the history of the next 70 years of left Marxist writings of India because he actually establishes a paradigm. It's an astonishing, I mean, you know, it's both, both brilliant. I mean, you have to really have that kind of imagination and that power of his writing. The trouble, of course, is that all such powerful writings tend to constrain your future imaginations. So M. N. Roy, uh, India in Transition, 1922, I'm sorry, it's not 21. 21 is when he went there. 22 is when the book comes out. It is preceded by a shorter book which M. N. Roy had written in 1918. Uh, M. N. Roy's life, incidentally, is something which you can read like a thriller. It's, a, it's an astonishing story of an Indian revolutionary who set out to you know, uh, purchase arms from India, ends up in Mexico, becomes a leading political figure in Mexico, goes to Europe, makes friends with Lenin, goes to advise Chinese Communist Party about how to create revolution in China. Thankfully, they didn't listen to him. And uh, you know, comes back, sets up a Communist Party in India, and so on. It's, I mean, you can actually read that life as a proper thriller. Uh, this book, however, I mean, I mean, Roy had written this book in uh, Mexico in 1918, a short book called India, Her Past, Present, and Future. Uh, for someone inclined to do research, it would be very instructive to compare this book with the book he wrote four years later because the, both the books offer dramatically different readings of India and tell you what happens to M. N. Roy when he converts to Marxism. Anyway, let's focus on uh, his, this book. What the book does is to place India in a European trajectory. It, what it does is that it, is, it puts it on a graph. It enables you to plot India where axes are familiar and given, borrowed from European history. He says capitalism is already established in India. However, the bourgeoisie is weak and cannot be robustly anti-colonial. There has already been rise of proletariat. Mind you, it's 1922. Roy is writing it in Europe. He says there is rise of proletariat. An intense class struggle has begun in India. Caste system, he says, has already finished this demise of caste system. Class is the reality of India. Congress's nationalism represents unreliable character of the capitalist class and therefore what you need is national liberation with socialist revolution. Sorry, it's just five line summary of a 400 page book. But uh, M. N. Roy interestingly establishes this framework of understanding India. What is interesting about this new paradigm, the new orthodoxy, is that it, it invites you to think of India as a country which is in transition. The name itself is very interesting. Transition presupposes you understand both the poles, where it started from and the telos towards which it's transiting. Deep faith in European modernity M. N. Roy has this peculiar habit of describing every Indian event with a parallel in European history. So every single Indian character is a distorted version of some true and authentic European character. Equality is of course distributive outcomes. 
and he combines it with militant nationalism. Unlike Bong Kim, Emin Roy has no difficulty in reconciling nationalism, anti-colonialism with critique of inequality within. So in this paradigm, you have strong universalism, contingencies of European experience are seen as natural and necessary forms through which every society has to pass. Second, there is distance from anything traditional. It simply turns its back on India's intellectual resources. That would be backward, that would be chauvinist, that would be conservative. M. N. Roy firmly turns his back to all that. India's specificity is understood as transient and surface specificity, which very soon will give way to proper, correct forms that you would find in European history. So the idea that what you witness in India today is only a recent or distant past of Europe is an idea that firmly gets entrenched with M. N. Roy. There is unitary view of India, that India may have diversity within and could actually comprise all kinds of social forms and production forms is something that doesn't interest M. N. Roy. And you can't blame someone who's writing that first book which gives you an overview. And what you have is a text-centric, experience-distant view of reality. There is no space for experiences and practices of actors. The categories that the actors themselves use are useless because they don't understand the, you know, really what's happening. Now, all the things that I've described continue to be strong hallmarks of Marxist readings of Indian society for the next 50, 60 years to come. Strong universalism, distance from traditions, Indian specificity as a transient form, unitary view of India in some ways, and text-centric experience distance view of reality. That's why I think M. N. Roy is simply such a powerful thinker for the 20th century. After that, there is a long period, say from 1920s, mid-20 is when this book comes. The history of the next almost 60 years has two traditions. There is an orthodox tradition and there is an unorthodox tradition. The orthodox tradition is what follows more or less the framework set by M. N. Roy faithfully. Interestingly, M. N. Roy's own framework allowed for two or three different readings which is what the left in India kept playing with. So in the orthodox tradition, I would put India's official communists. Uh, they were radical in many ways, but in terms of ideas, I thought of them as conformists. Uh, the CPI, CPM, Nexalites, all of them play within a very, very limited range set by the, by, you know, of the frame given in M. N. Roy's book. The Congress Socialist, especially the PSP tradition and the Janta family, and the Congress left. All of them, all this is part of the orthodox tradition. The PSP tradition of socialism also fell very much within that orthodox reading. At the same time, you have an unorthodox tradition. That unorthodox tradition, heterodox tradition of India, comes because this idea of equality enters into an encounter with something outside. What was that outside? It could be two or three things. One encounter with Gandhi. Encounter with Mahatma Gandhi actually was a source of so much of soul searching, so much of creative thinking. How to, how to engage with the old man is something that kept bothering Indian left, Indian socialists particularly. Those who, uh, within the Indian left, there were the two traditions, the communists who were outside and the socialists who became part of the Congress within. Especially those who were within had serious existential anxieties about how to deal with the old man. Uh, partly because the old man was very kind. So Jayaprakash Narayan was actually son-in-law of Mahatma Gandhi because Gandhiji had adopted his wife as his daughter. And interestingly, the first proper Marxist critique of Mahatma Gandhi was written by Jayaprakash Narayan living as Gandhiji's son-in-law in his ashram. 
uh, where Jayaprakash Narayan says uh, Gandhi, you know, he may be a nice person, but in the last instance, he's an agent of the bourgeoisie. Uh, so, but you have these existential encounters that keep happening. Um, encounter with Mahatma Gandhi leads people like Jayaprakash Narayan, Vinoba Bhave, Ram Manohar Lohia, and Acharya Javadekar in Maharashtra, somewhat lesser known thinker, uh, to reinterpreting Marxism and equality. It also, a different kind of encounter happens when some of them encounter religious tradition. Obedullah Sindhi, in what is now Pakistan, encounters Islam, and he wants to reconcile his egalitarianism to Islam. Bhagwan Das, uh, another Indian thinker of 1930s and 40s, wants to reconcile socialism to Vedas and wants to think of Vedic socialism. Acharya Narendra Dev is a, is a renowned scholar of Buddhism and he wants to understand egalitarianism through Buddhist lens. So you have all these experiments that are happening and of course not to forget Ambedkar who, who simply steps out of much of this and thinks of equality in a very different way. So all these experiments are taking place. I wouldn't bore you with the details of each of those experiments. And like in the earlier phases, I'll just pick one thinker, which is Ram Manohar Lohia. Uh, someone I have learned so much from. What is unusual about Ram Manohar Lohia is, I mean, just, just to give you basics, uh, Ram Manohar Lohia is an Indian socialist who, unlike most Indians of that time, goes not to Britain or to America, goes to Germany to study, comes back and is a, is a rebel nationalist socialist, becomes one of the founder members of Congress Socialist Party, and after independence is a leader of India's socialist movement uh, and India's socialist party. Someone who tries to rethink the foundations of the idea of equality. Two interesting things in Lohia. Lohia is the first Indian thinker to directly confront the question of Eurocentricity of the idea of equality. He has this famous essay called Doctrinal Foundations of Asian Socialism. And basically the essay says this. It says that so far the idea of equality has been colonized by Eurocentric imagination. That we Asians cannot possibly borrow European socialism and live with it we have to reinvent the foundations of socialism in our context. And what is wrong with the uh, uh, socialist thought? Lohia says, uh, I, I would just quote one small, th this is just one quotation. He says, no greater disaster can befall socialism than if the historical peculiarities of its career in Europe were sought to be universalized and reproduced in the other two-thirds of the world. Socialism in Europe has been gradual, constitutional, and distributive. Socialism henceforth and in the rest of the world must be drastic, unconstitutional, when necessary, and laid accent on production. He goes on to write a critique of Marxist economics, how development in one was preconditioned on underdevelopment of the other. Lohia writes a book called, uh, unfinished book called Economics After Marx, and Lohia's project thereafter is to do a critique of economics, politics, and philosophy and history that socialist thought has presupposed. And he goes on to rewrite all of these. In Lohia, you have an extension of a critique of Marxism in terms of critique of the dominant frames of knowledge, limits of modern civilization, and critique of 
cosmopolitanism that passes for universalism in our part of the world. And he searches for an alternative universalism. There has been a lot of research, literature in the last 20 years on alternative modernities. And to me, it appears that one of the first Indian thinkers to anticipate that is Ramana Loya. He actually, actually says that in India, we can produce modernity of a kind that Europe has never known and cannot imagine. Uh, so there is a search for alternative modernities. He wants to produce a non-provincial reading of history, forward-looking modernism, third camp in world politics, and vision of an alternative civilization. What Lohia does, he changes the idea, he recasts the idea of revolution. He basically says, the idea of revolution that we ha has come to us from Marxism is based on only one of the aspects, which is class. What we need, he says, are seven revolutions at the same time. What are these seven revolutions? Against gender inequalities. And Lohia is again one of the early thinkers from outside a proper feminist tradition, uh, one of the first egalitarian thinkers to lay emphasis on gender equality. Against gender inequalities, against caste inequalities, against inequalities between rich and poor, against racial inequalities, against inequalities among nations, also against encroachment of privacy by collectives, and finally, seventh one, for civil disobedience, resistance to injustice. So what he does is that he opens up thinking about equality to, into, to, to multiple dimensions. And what he does is to move away from that debate about whether caste is real or class is real, which of them is the real distinction around which society needs to be organized and reorganized. And he says you have to look at all of them at the same time. He does critique of Marxist social, uh, economics and politics. I'll skip all that. What he does is something radical. In a very short essay called Concept of Equality, he actually changes the received ways of thinking about equality. It's a very short essay, almost incomplete. Towards the end, he's sort of brushing, uh, you know, clearly without, you know, he doesn't have much time to spell it out. But what he does is to say, what we have called equality so far is equality in the material realm and in the internal dimension. That is to say, material equality within a nation or a country is what we have called equality so far. He says we need to think afresh. Equality has a material and a spiritual dimension. And it should be realized in the external and the internal domain. That gives you a four, sort of two by two table of four. One is, of course, a familiar one, inward approximation among classes within a country. So class differences within a country should be reduced. The second one, material, external, is again somewhat familiar, which is to say uh, equality among nations, among countries in the world. And Lohia kept saying, that Marxism draws your attention away from equality across different countries. And uh, much of the communist politics actually takes you away from that, etc. Interestingly, he then says, spiritual, in the spiritual realm, what is external and internal equality? In the external domain, equality, spiritual equality would mean kinship, fraternity, bandhutva. And in the inner domain, equality should mean equanimity, samadrishti, samabhava. It is one of the rare attempts in the egalitarian tradition of India to reconnect with that other notion of equality that we had abandoned in the 19th century. I'll take a jump once again and come to the last phase which is after the fall, after 1989, you know. After the fall of Soviet Union, after the fall of dominant socialist paradigms, there is a dead end. There are new beginnings. There is dead end, although nothing really dies in India. Stalin may die in 
USSR or Russia, he would continue to live in India. Victorian English, after a few years, would be spoken only in India, nowhere else. So certain things never die in this country. But a certain way of th that, that dominant left ways of thinking suddenly come to a halt. They reach a dead end. Collapse of Soviet Union leads to a political extinction of distinct socialist political stream. There's an abandonment of official, social, official socialism. It becomes embarrassing. You know, today if you call yourself socialist, it almost looks like Gali. When people have to attack Ahmadmi Party, they say, look at people like you again. They are socialists. Full stop. QED. You know, <laughs> so that's the end of it. Uh, but this is the time when the idea of equality is being reinvented by those who do not officially affiliate to the egalitarian tradition. It is being reinvented in farmers' movement, women's movement, Dalit movements. Victims of development and displacement are rewriting the rules of what equality should mean, what kind of struggles we need for the next century. You have lots of new activist thinkers. I'll just mention one of them. Some of them are new Gandhians, ecologists, reconstructed socialists, Dalit and feminist theorists. Allow me to pick just one, Kishan Patnaik, who's no more. Uh, Kishan Patnaik has written a book which, for which we don't have a decent English, we don't have an English translation at all, actually. And Vishnuda, one of the things you can do is to read his Uriya writings and actually make it available. I mean, I always uh, wonder why D.R. Nagaraj and Kishan Patnaik are not available to the rest of the world. Our friend Prithvi has done some service, and now D.R. Nagaraj, I believe, is available in English. Uh, but uh, so we should do for Kishan Patnaik. Uh, what Kishan Patnaik does, uh, Kishan Patnaik uh, is, in a sense, a thinker of the new social movements. And through the 80s, 90s, until 2004, he is reimagining what it would mean to be egalitarian, socialist. He stops using the word socialism. And uh, in his book, when asked to describe his ideology, he says, this is a deshaj vichar. He does not call samajwad. He was a samajwadi. He refuses to use the word Samajwad. He says this is a Deshaj Vichar. Deshaj, indigenous thought. Not desh, it's not indigenous, but anyway. Uh, uh, what he does that he, is that he re-engages with Gandhi's critique of modern civilization. And within the egalitarian tradition, he insists that we need to rethink the very idea of development. So the critique of development, which has been developing, which has been evolving outside the egalitarian tradition, and egalitarians look down upon it, Kishan Patnaik brings it to the very heart of egalitarian imagination. And invites us to look for new forms of resistance among people who are fighting displacement, among subnational movements like Assam movement, Punjab movement, which were seen by the official left and progressives as chauvinist movements, and asks us to re-engage with farmers' movement. Uh, no wonder he was a friend of Professor Nanjuda Swami, who we should recall today. Uh, he doesn't provide a full-fledged frame of how to rethink the idea of equality for 21st century. But we can try and develop one, looking at this entire history. I will just talk about two things towards the end, having done this survey. One is to say, through this history, do we discover some new intellectual resources? And second, can we recast the idea of equality do we have some nodes around which we can recast the idea of equality? So let me end by just stating a few things there. Uh, because in many ways, and that is what connects to my present birth, 
uh, politics of the 20th century is about reimagining what it means to be left, what it means to be radical, what it means to be socialist. These words are dead, they are gone. They don't have purchase with the new generation. They don't have purchase with uh, the victims of oppression and injustice. But there is injustice, there is oppression, there is inequality. How do we recast it is a question that we need to ask. Some of the resources available to us are, as I said, just to recall, early responses to socialism, which emphasize ethical core of socialism rather than its paraphernalia of historical materialism and everything else. Second, unusual encounters. I just mentioned Maulana Obedullah Sindhi, Bhagwan Das, Acharya Narendra Dev, JP, Acharya, Acharya Javadekar. These unusual encounters have produced some very unusual conceptual resources for us to go back and try and recover. There are external resources available which the idea of equality has not sufficiently made use of. Narayan Guru, Ambedkar, Periyar. There are resources offered by ecologists, feminists, and the Swaraj tradition in the post-Gandhian Gandhism. These are all resources available for recasting the idea of equality today. But how do we recast it? I'll just raise a few questions. First, must equality be the central organizing principle of politics? This is what egalitarians always thought. They thought equality is not just one of the values. It is to be the central organizing principle. The more I think about it, the more I'm convinced that actually radical politics of future need not place the idea of equality at the center. It has to be one of the organizing principles. Why should it be at the center? It's not quite clear. Second, should the state be the principal agency for social transformation? This has been almost a matter of faith for all egalitarians. And that's why, you know, harking back to state, public sector, license quota raj, you know, there's a problem, state has to solve it. This is not what people thought 150 years ago. And maybe they were right. Can we think of multiple agencies? This excessive reliance on state as, a, as, as, some, as, as the agency for social transformation is probably overdone. Third, can European modernity be the cultural touchstone for politics of equality? It has remained so. Uh, much of the thinking about India has been, <clears throat> much of the egalitarian tradition has treated European modernity as the cultural touchstone. Everything is with reference to that. Can we not rethink that? And finally, how do we ground politics of equality in partial truths, contingencies, and particularities? Much of the egalitarian tradition has participated in that strong form of universalism. Need we do that? Ramano Lohia opens his book, Marx, Gandhi, and Socialism, by reflecting on the idea of partial truth, which then looked very odd. And it still is very odd for a practicing politician to begin writing a book by saying the truth is partial. No one picked up that particular strand of Lohia, and it sort of passed. No one remembered that. But in many ways, that idea actually opens the possibility of a new epistemology of egalitarianism. The attempt to ground egalitarianism in strong positivist universalism is something that needs to be questioned. And that allows us to understand India in a different way. How do we relate to India's past? Is India's past only a source of 
source of problems, embarrassments, source of these uh, wretched, negative, conservative traditions? Or can we look at it at India's past equally as a resource repository of ideas, values, conceptual resources? That's one question we need to reflect on. How do we erase elements of self-hatred that pass off as radicalism in India? Uh, I strongly believe so. Sorry, it's stated somewhat strongly. But so much of what passes for radicalism in this country is nothing but cultural self-hatred. Uh, this is passed off sometimes as radicalism, sometimes as left, sometimes as modernity or whatever. But no society evolves by simply presenting self-hatred. And what was, what is the, the, the strength of European socialism was that it picked up the best of European traditions. It actually picks up the best of Christian values, incorporates that. Our radicalism, our egalitarianism, however, wants to turn its back to all that our traditions have to offer. So do we really need to hate ourselves, our culture, so much? How do we learn from European social theory is the final question I wish to ask. There are the manner in which much of egalitarian thinking of the 20th century has related to, modern, to European social theory is to treat it as a repository of abstractions which can be brought and applied to India. The assumption, of course, is that these are true universal abstractions. I'm not too sure. I've come to believe that underlying each of these abstractions is a special contingent, it's peculiar contingencies of the experience of a tiny part of the world called Europe. So when we use the word state, in small tiny brackets, there is some Europe inscribed there, European state. When we say society, all kinds of, every one of these social theory concepts have Europe inscribed into that. And to my mind, the challenge is for egalitarian traditions to empty European social theory of its contingent experience, which are lodged inside these concepts, and to fill these concepts again with experiential concepts and practices drawn from our Indian reality. This is as much a challenge for egalitarians as for much of our social science. It is as much a theoretical challenge as it is a political challenge. The challenge today is to not to turn our back to these 150 years, engaging years of thinking about equality. It is quite fashionable today because somehow we've persuaded ourselves, especially if we read the print press, we persuaded ourselves that equality, the ideas like equality, especially economic equality and such like, are, are, are matters of past. What is required is not to turn our back to this rich tradition, but to reconceptualize it, to reformat it for a new kind of radical politics. It is possible and likely that this new politics will not call itself by any familiar name. It will not call itself socialist. It will not call itself left. And it shouldn't as long as it speaks to concerns about inequality, injustice, exploitation, and wants to find a way past that. This, as I said, is as much a theoretical challenge as it is a political challenge. And what I meant to do today was to invite you to join everyone in this theoretical and political challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, very exciting presentation. I think we have around half an hour for question, answer, and so on. I, for myself, can say that it resonated in 
many things. And uh, as we say, uh, every reflection on past cannot escape the light of the present. And in some sense, uh, your talk also tell, told us a lot about that. Now I think I open it up uh, for uh, comments, questions, and uh, be brief so that we have time for taking many questions. Please raise your hand and so on. Yes. Omissions and uh, one of them was Fami Shkarthan and the other was Bhagat Singh. And we talk about decantarians and both of them are going to end. Perhaps there's more like Vinayat Hazani also, you can go back who coined it from the last week, Sindhabad. The second thing is when you kind of say that the official left of the communists in India did not creatively interpret India's past or had a negative view of India's past. I don't quite buy that because especially if you look at the Naxal tradition in Andhra Pradesh, I mean you actually have some very, very creative thinking. You, for instance, you have someone like Jadar who claimed lineage from Tukara, you know, I mean, which is actually, and you have something like the Kabir Kalamanch, which is a radical cultural group in Maharashtra. And then you have someone like Harugopal and Balagopal, who are very, very creative and imaginative thinkers. And who interpreted Marxism in their own way in Andhra Pradesh. I mean, so you actually have a very different tradition of even Marxism in India, which you can find among communists. And the third question is when you really talk about something like the European India, I mean, sometimes that kind of uh, dichotomy becomes pretty glaring because someone like Ambedkar, who had a lot of ideas that he borrowed from John Dewey, today is perhaps a symbol of a movement that emanates from the ground perhaps more. You know, you had also someone like Mayavati, who perhaps calls me Ambedkar, right? You had. So it's actually that kind of dichotomy does not necessarily, it's a very difficult dichotomy, and perhaps it should not, that's not the language one should talk in. And uh, the last question that I have. Uh, there's also the fact that each of these ideas had a certain social base to it, which is why they came in. I mean, we can't really ignore the fact that there's a social base, there's a material base, by which carried these ideas. So, so we can't... Right. Later on, question. Thank you. The distinction you made in, 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 in the first of your last closing remarks about removing equality from being a core organizing principle to one of the important organizing principles. Can you talk, expand a little bit on, on, on what remedy that would provide? Uh, yes, I think I've enjoyed your talk a lot. My question is about the whole concept of power. In engaging with equality, when you put power into it, I was wondering how you think about it. Mainly when you talk about universalism, the role of the state, it all comes down to the fact that can an individual be powerful enough to actually bring about that equality that you would want? I think I just want to make one statement. We have to talk a little loudly. Yeah. I think there are no insurmountable conflicts between A, P, P, and P, J. You and the Amitra can sit across and talk. Uh, and possibly, there is at least a possibility of a Sharad Yadav Advari relationship in P, J. <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 I wanted to probe. Just one second. Now. I wanted to actually probe you a bit on one of the ideas you suggested that should state be the sole agency of protection of equality. And uh, I think, I mean, uh, you know, if we see today what's happening as a way of recasting equality as a lawyer, and in legal terms, we are moving away from merely the state. I mean, if you look at the Right to Education Act, which uh, enforces obligations of equality on private schools, if you look at sexual harassment law, which imposes obligations of equality on private employers, I think this can be in our uh, in Indian, other Indian philosophy of equality. Do you think it has any support or it's just a European uh, so way? So you have a question? Okay, why not? To, uh, so that to be add to this question. Uh, so you said state need not be the center uh, for equality for the 21st century. But in your earlier lecture, you had said, while ta talking about alternatives to politics, where you mentioned NGOs and social movements, they are in a way parallel to parallels to the democracy and a <coughs> threat, perhaps, an imminent threat to the de democracy. So, are these two ideas uh, conflicting, or are you? Sorry, sorry, come again. Okay, you had said, uh, while talking about alternatives to politics, you had mentioned NGOs and the uh, social movements and you did uh, uh, appreciate their uh, contribution, but you said in a way they they are parallels to the democracy and thus a threat. So aren't these two's idea where you say on one side that state need not be uh, the center of equality, um, aren't these two conflicting or you are suggesting a combination of both? I would request that uh, you get to respond to some of that in the other five people in the line. Okay. 
starting from the end. <clears throat> I was hoping that uh, no one person would listen to all the three lectures that I delivered in the city. <laughs> but you have. So. Uh, uh, I think there's a clear difference here between sole agency through which we imagine egalitarian project and saying that politics is essential. In the other lecture, I was, I was critiquing the politics of anti-politics and to say, you know, let's shun politics, politics is useless, etc. Um, there are, I think in your, the presupposition here is equation of politics with state. That need not be the case. Uh, politics can have a much wider canvas and need not be confined only to what the state does. And if we look at that way, there is no necessary tension between these two things. On the question of state as an agency, um, there is a weaker version and there is a stronger version. Uh, the weaker version would say uh, that uh, that it's not just state, we sh the laws should also apply to private agencies, to private schools, to the private sector, etc., etc. But ev even in this instance, it is the state which requires the private schools, the private sector to do certain things. So in this weaker version, state still remains predominant. Uh, I would be willing to look at a stronger version that actually moves away from state, even in this sense of the term. Uh, uh, Shudipto Kaviraj has uh, written something about the last, uh, in India, India's intellectual history, and he calls it enchantment with state. Isn't that the word he uses here? Uh, for the last uh, almost two centuries, we Indians have had such a deep enchantment with state. We discovered it, found it, you know, the, the modern state. And then we sort of, in a sense, mounted all our dreams onto this new agent. Uh, but is it actually wise to do so? Can we not think of, I mean, do we not want uh, age, and I'll give you some very simple example. Uh, for the last uh, few months, the thing that makes me, uh, you know, which I've been thinking about again and again as I travel through villages in Haryana, is the question of liquor. Uh, liquor menace is one of the biggest problems in rural Haryana, which our radicals do not write very much about, probably because I like, we like our drink in the evening, but it's actually a huge social menace. Now, one of the first responses that we have is, all right, so shall we get the state to pass a law which would require that the following shops not be closed, etc. You know, we again, so there, there is a problem, we recognize it to be the problem, and we turn to the state. So new laws, some form of restrictions and this and that, which is important, which is useful. Uh, the state, the least that the state can do is not to become a liquor promotion bureau, which it has become in many parts of India. But don't we all recognize that state is actually a small player in this business? That in the last instance, this problem has to be encountered within families. This problem has to be encountered uh, by society. Look at the range of problems. We want uh, unequal sex ratio to be sorted out by a piece of law. We want dowry, we want domestic violence, we want, I mean, look at the range of things for which we turn to state to resolve it. And given the emphasis on state, no wonder many of these things rebound and come back to haunt us, you know. So uh, I just picked up examples from one domain. We could think of examples from several other domains to actually see why egalitarian agency should be so preoccupied with state. The, you know, societies in the past and hopefully in the future will look at multiple agencies, state being one of them. That's what I was trying to say. Uh, the point about Sharad Adhav and Adwani, I could 
evade it by <coughs> thinking of it as a cryptic remark on contemporary politics. But I thought you were saying something deeper than that. I thought I could misconstrue you, but I thought you were saying that, the, that what I was implying had actually such strong resonance to what the BJP RSS would wish to say. Uh, I take it as a uh, serious criticism. Um, and I'm glad someone said that. Because if no one had said that, I would have thought the whole point of what I had said is missed. Um, it's very important to think about this question today. Uh, let's use the word which has not been used in this hall so far. Narendra Modi. <laughs> there, he who is not, <laughs> not to be named. So let's begin by naming him. Uh, what used to be a nightmare for many of us a few years ago is a reality today. What has brought us to that reality? I believe that, and I said that yesterday in one of the lectures, that there are three anxieties that Mr. Modi addresses and that all of us are guilty of producing that anxiety, those anxieties. First was to do with governance, second was to do with economic growth, etc. But I'll focus on the third one, which is a cultural anxiety. There has been a deep cultural anxiety shared by many Indians, but not people like us. And that cultural anxiety is something like this. Do I have to be embarrassed about my own culture, my language, my tradition, my religion in my own country? <coughs> These people, these mythical English-speaking, foreign-funded, secular, deracinated intellectuals, will they continue to rule the country? Will they continue to tell me how I have to behave in my own country? There is an anxiety of that kind. We could simply turn our back to it and say, ah, this is false anxiety, don't live, don't, you know, daydream. We could say, why should majority, you know, behave like minority? Wake up, you are a majority in this country. That's not a right answer. I think we should recognize this anxiety for what it is. Uh, there is a deep cultural gap, vacuum, distance felt by ordinary people, especially those among the ordinary people who, who have just entered the peripheries of modernity, of modern life, of urban India, of these things. Mr. Modi speaks to that anxiety. He gives them an answer. And the answer is, we are majority in this country. Don't worry, we'll do what we like. All of us know how dreadful this answer is. I don't have to convince this crowd that this could be the end of the idea of India, this kind of anxiety. How do we respond to this? To my mind, the response to this has to be to actually acknowledge the grain of truth in it deracinated intellectual is not a mythical figure. They probably exist, probably inside this room as well. That, as I speak to, you know, one of the games I used to play with some of my friends was have a group of intellectuals in a room and ask them a simple question. When was the last time you read one full book in any Indian language? When was the last time you wrote an A4 size paper in any Indian language? I'll not ask you this question. I think we have the answer. There is something out there. We have neglected a connect. We are guilty. We need to reestablish that connect. And when we go to reestablish that connect, we do not have to take the shallow path of that connect which the BJP and RSS have taken. These fellows have no understanding of our traditions. That they become the most legitimate heir of our cultural traditions 
is nothing but a commentary on our political bankruptcy, our inability to relate to our traditions in any serious sense. If the radicals of this country, egalitarian, socialist, left, what have you, if they had established meaningful relationship with our cultural traditions, there is no way these people who have not one quarter of an understanding of our traditions could pass off as this. What we have done is that we have handed on a platter nationalism, Hinduism, culture, tradition, language, everything to Modi's of the world. And at the end of it, if we are powerless, isn't it, is it surprising? So to my mind, this is the moment to reflect, to go back, to re-establish a connect. Yes, take the risk of appearing to be like Mr. Adwani to few persons for a little while. It's all right. And when we take that journey, we would have you are Anantamurti with us, someone I should have recalled right at the beginning of my lecture. I think that's what I wish to recall. And that's an important answer. Sorry, I feel very strongly about some of these things. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, on Why should equality not be the core principle? Uh, the organizing principle of a society has to be something deeper than mere equal or just distribution of goods and services. Um, I think there is something spiritually shallow about the egalitarian tradition of the kind that we have led. And no wonder egalitarianism, socialism or whatever, does not answer some of the deeper anxieties of our life. At some point or the other, all of us face questions like, who am I? Why am I here? What is death? How do I relate to it? And any, any idea that does not enable us to relate to some of these fundamental you know, questions cannot become the fundamental organizing principle of our society. There can be many. Uh, so, so our enchantment with the idea of equality is also our enchantment with limited questions of material distribution, which has, you know, involved, which has obsessed us for the last 150 years. These are good questions. But in some ways, the questions that the Sant and the Bhakti tradition had raised were actually much deeper questions. Um, I didn't fully understand the question of power, so please allow me to come back to that later. Um, I thought your questions were very relevant, uh, and thank you for reminding me. Uh, it is true that, uh, um, that uh, in uh, Bhagat Singh, in Swami Shraddhan, I mean, there, there's this, such a long list of people who come up with it. I'm not so sure that Bhagat Singh, who all we Wish to, who wish to, we all wish to celebrate and I invoke all the time, especially in today's time and age, it's important to remember what Bhagat Singh's notion of India's the Indian nation was. But do we have conceptual innovation there as a historian? Um, in Swami Sajanan Saraswati, in Swami Shraddhanand, do we have that kind of conceptual innovation? I would like to be convinced. On the Nexalite relationship, with uh, you know, the invoking of Tukaram. I, I actually did not know of the thinker you mentioned, so that's my limitation. I would wish to read more. But I would uh, just ask you this question later. There are two ways in which we can relate to the past thinkers. One is, I know what are my values, and then I go back to the past to see who resembles what I had said, what I believe in. This is what the communists have done. Remember, CPM has actually brought out a booklet on Vivekananda. No one reads it, no one should read it, because uh, uh, there is uh, there's no deep engagement there. I know, I know my values, and now I want to get five quotes from Vivekananda to endorse my values. That's not the way to relate to the past. You go to the past uh, to learn from the past. You go there at least with a belief that you may be wrong that they may have known it better. I want to see that kind of an engagement. Um, 
uh, in the case it is uh, you are correct to point out that uh, uh, that Ambedkar is one striking example of uh, someone who took Western European ideas quite in a straight un, um, unreconstructed manner and has actually been able to connect to the exploited. So that actually is a very good counterexample to what I was saying. Um, I have a weak defense to offer to that, which is that sometimes in the case of the most deprived, the most disadvantaged, opening an external window can sometimes be such a source of liberation, uh, which is what happened. But uh, let us not think of that as a rule. To my mind, it's an exception. Periyar, yeah, I mean, you know, what you say about Ambedkar would apply to Periyar, partially to Fule, which I mentioned. All of them are inspired by Western ideas straight away. Uh, to my mind, uh, the kind of connect they were able to establish with the people uh, is a would fall in the case of in the exceptional category and would be to do with the fact that for the most marginalized and disadvantaged, sometimes a complete rejection can actually be a source of radical relief. But if you read my other favorite author, Dia Nagaraj, uh, he would tell you that the manner in which Ambedkar turned his back to Dalit memories, Dalit traditions, was probably not so empowering. <clears throat> Uh, five individuals. <laughs> I haven't seen I haven't seen anything more than five, and we have ten minutes more past seven, so we can go on till that time. So I I would request uh, the individuals to be very brief, uh, one minute each, so that we have five minutes for Yagendra before we wrap it up. Um, I got uh, uh, the the crux of that. I, I have a question. Um, Egalitarian and the thinking of egalitarian has actually got us in India into this shit is how I got one of the uh, uh, things on that. The comment and what I would like you to comment is organizing on egalitarianism vis-a-vis -vis organizing on the individual which I think is a lot more in our tradition past in the backgrounds in our history and our culture and therefore the other influencing factor on democracy and freedom, the United States of America, which unabashedly says unequal, in unequality uh, exists, but society based on the individual and freedoms for the individual and opportunities for the individuals are the right way of thinking. I would like you to comment on that. should be that. But uh, my question to you is very briefly is that how do you, I'm interested in knowing how do you see this whole notion of equality in the kind of society that we are built up on hierarchy and repulsion. Our social fabric is basically built up on hierarchy and repulsion. Uh, so where do you see the notion of equality really emerging? Rich and provocative and troubling uh, as it should be. Tell us a little bit more about how to think through self-hating. The reason I ask is because uh, all too often around the world, uh, self-hating is a pejorative used actually by those who are anti-egalitarian. So a good example, for example, is self-hating Jew. Anyone who talks about uh, from the Jewish intellectual tradition, who talks about in any critical manner about Israel, for example, is branded that and I take your point very well that we have to have some uh, very deep understanding and connect with cultural traditions but for example Khap Panchayats would uh, uh, have something to say about uh, whoever criticizes them as you're a self-hating person. Yes. If you try and promote egalitarianism and uh, equality um, beyond a certain extent it actually encourages mediocrity. And that has always worried me. Won't you comments on that?
my attempt uh, today was to pick up just one illustrative thinker from five phases uh, as and when I get to write it which is to say as and when I get interval during politics uh, the you are absolutely right to say the history should have a lot to uh, do uh, not only with the Savitri by Pule uh, actually if you look at the 19th century Indian writings uh, they invite you to think of the gender question in somewhat different way. Uh, and yes, that must form a part of that larger narrative. Today my concern was not to get the narrative right, but simply to pick one person from each and just to illustrate the points. Uh, <clears throat> the two questions about equality promoting mediocrity and about uh, the US tradition of freedom individuality are sort of connected. Uh, if you had asked me this uh, question 10 years ago, I would have come back with very sharp retorts. Uh, but uh, today I won't. Uh, not because I have joined politics or wish to be politically correct, but because I've learned. Uh, I, think the, I think one of the mistakes of the egalitarians was, you know, you know, what we forget is a distinction between recognizing that this is a value and saying that this is the only value. I think egalitarians have committed that mistake very often uh, from recognizing this as a value and to saying this is the only value. I do actually now think that uh, a society where equality is not only a central value but also the only value would be a dreadful society to live in. Uh, to recognize that all human beings should have equal respect in a minimal sense because they are human beings is absolutely right. You know, you cannot imagine a society that wouldn't do that, a, a good society. But to think of a society which would flatten everyone uh, into uh, that homogenization, that equal treatment of all, would actually be dreadful. Do we want to hear uh, average singers? Do we want to list, look at average painters? We don't. Uh, so I agree, actually. And I'm sure you are not therefore saying that uh, equality should not be <laughs> one of the key principles. Uh, uh, and uh, yes, certain kind of equality can promote mediocrity. I wouldn't have recognized it 10 years ago. Uh, on the point about freedom, individual, and the American tradition, uh, actually, I wasn't, I mean, your, your, your rapid summary was not only rapid, it was probably not entirely accurate, uh, because I actually mean to celebrate that tradition. The egalitarian tradition is not something I look down upon. I think... I should have probably said all those things, but I just took it for granted. Uh, egalitarian tradition in our country has uh, actually been the source of some of the most liberating imagination, some of the finest literature, some of the best cinema, some of the, uh, some of the most liberating movements, individuals, and in many ways, Egalitarian tradition has democratized the idea of democracy in our country. So there's a lot. I mean, they, have, they may have pushed us into some strange consequences, which all good ideas do. So I don't mean to look at that as a merely a problem. And uh, one of the interesting things about Indian, uh, modern Indian political thinking is that uh, you actually don't have uh, a tradition which actually picks on that American tradition of freedom and freedom in that sense. There's a lot of talk about freedom. But that American tradition of celebrating freedom in that one dimensional way, which again pushes the idea of freedom to crazy uh, sort of uh, limits, freedom to bear arms, freedom to kill someone, freedom, to, you know, all kinds of strange consequences that come from that. Um, we have simply not had a tradition of that sort. 
And I'm not sure if we have been poorer for the absence of that tradition. Uh, the, uh, the question about self-hatred and the other thing is again uh, related. <clears throat> I take your point that dignity has to be a strong component and I actually think in that sense uh, it, if we were to allow the idea of dignity to enter into a dialogue with pre-modern conceptions of samabhava, uh, we have uh, a very interesting exploration there. But when you then say that we have a society based on hierarchy and repulsion, um, I think we may be stepping precisely into that kind of self-hatred. You know, the, I the idea that the, the, the way you can summarize Indian society is a, is a society based on hierarchy, repulsion, oppression and so on, this is a certain rhetoric set up by um, a certain kind of radical politics in the past and recently. Um, as you can see, the burden of what I'm trying to argue goes against this thinking. This, to my mind, is precisely self-hatred. I take your point that uh, anyone who wishes to critique a society would be dubbed with self-hatred. So maybe I should withdraw that label. Yeah, because it's a, it's a label that can be used rather indiscriminately. Uh, but I think the manner in which Indian society was understood and cast had, ve had very, in, in some subtle ways, carried colonial images and presuppositions. And in some ways, Colonial presuppositions entered not only modern Indian thought, but also entered modern radical thought. And if you want an example of how India bashing can be seen as radical understanding of India, radical, emancipatory, egalitarian, revolutionary, uh, you must read uh, Perry Anderson's latest book on India. That, actually, if you need one example of how, it's not self-hatred, but it's a, uh, it's a certain, uh, I mean, I, I should probably recast it to simply say that much of what passes for egalitarian, socialist, progressive, left, or social scientific reading of India contains within it two strong, several very strong presuppositions derived from European misunderstanding of India. Uh, a certain form of Orientalism informs very deeply not just Indian social science, but also Indian radicalism. And much of Indian radicalism actually is based on a very simplistic Orientalist reading of India. Uh, that is what we need to correct. Uh, so let's not call it self-hatred, let's call it by some other name. But it is a very derivative understanding of India. And that derivative understanding of India has to be corrected. Uh, so uh, I would therefore conclude that no, I don't think Indian, the, that Indian society can be summarized as a society based on hierarchy and repulsion. I know it makes it politically incorrect to say so in these times. But uh, I think the beginning of a new understanding of Indian society has to be, yes, there was hierarchy, yes, there was repulsion, but there was a lot more as well. Thank you. Yagendra, thank you very much. I think uh, every rereading of the past and rereading of the present, uh, I think, creates both individual and institutional obligations. You know, we take these kind of things very seriously without really saying that university is the only place where knowledge is produced or ratified. But having said that, I think we take these things very seriously. I only want to add one thing that besides the tracts that you adduced as evidence or examples, we want to bring in Bhasa literature. If you look at Vasa literature of the late 20th century, you actually have a far more nuanced and very interesting insight into the domain of inequality 
exploitation equality. So I think, I think there I think we, we, we agree with that. I think, uh, um, as I said, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, of uh, inviting Yagendra. It's also, I'm greatly thankful to Yagendra for finding this time uh, to be a part of our public lecture series of the Ajim Premji University. I also want to thank uh, the people in the Ajim Premji University who made it possible, including my dear friend, Professor Chandan Gowda, who actually took over all the logistics. And, uh, and, and all, uh, all of you who made it possible uh, to come here. And Yogendra, you have been always a pleasure. I think we, uh, we might have differences, but I think these differences are very important. <laughs> and, 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 and I once again thank you on behalf of each of one of you, uh, Ajim Premji University, and I'm sure that we would eventually would create a better and more intense discussion and research around the stuff that you raised, but far more because as we believe, some of these things are done by doing it, not by saying that we want to do it, but we ought to do it. I think with these words, I think I once again thank you very much. I think we will keep this public lecture series going and uh, thank you once again. I, I just wanted to announce my email ID. I should have done that. Please feel free to send me feedback on that. It's simply my name at gmail.com, yogendra.yadav at gmail.com. Thank you.